Great. So welcome everybody to our advanced Apple production management webinar series organized by the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the University of Minnesota Extension. Uh, I'm Amaya Tucha and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Horticulture and a fruit crop specialist with the Division of Extension at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and I will be your moderator for this webinar. Today, we will be discussing ground cover management with Annie Claude. Annie is a statewide extension educator for fruit and vegetable production at the University of Minnesota. So, and Annie is, you know, uh, one of our team members. So we are, we are wrapping up this uh, final webinar on this series with, with Annie. And thank you for putting together this uh, really important topic. And I know that there's a lot of interest on this topic. Just want to remind everybody, uh, please not to unmute yourself during the talk so we don't interrupt Annie. Also, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box or the Q&A and we'll discuss it at the very end. I also will ask people to turn off the, your camera because we're recording this and we're going to uh, upload it after to our YouTube channels and it's better if we have all the cameras off. And with that, Annie, the floor is yours. All right, thanks, Amaya. And in a second, I'm probably gonna turn my camera off too because I'm in a standing desk and I want the freedom to be able to stand or sit or move around the room. So, um, but you know, I'm here, hi. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna just share my screen right now. Get it out of presenter mode. All right, so you should be able to see my screen now. Um, yes. Let me, you're good? Okay, good. Okay, so um, I titled my talk, What's on Your Vineyard, or What's on Your Orchard Floor? Managing Ground Covers and Under Row Cover Crops. And you'll see throughout this presentation that sometimes I talk about vines, or I might accidentally call things vines instead of trees. That is because I have given this talk also to grape growers, but also it's because this topic is just as relevant for apples as it is for grapevines. And so um, I'm drawing from research during this presentation that was done in both orchards and, uh, and vineyards. And so if you hear me accidentally say grapevine instead of apple, um, don't be offended or confused. I'm just, uh, I'm just, thinking about grapes. So um, I hope you enjoy this presentation. So first, I just wanted to start and in, instead of a show of hands, you could just do this maybe in the chat. Um, I'm curious, does anyone here currently keep grass or cover crops in your rows, you know, underneath your trees or vines? Um, so you can just say that in the chat, just trying to get an idea of who's already sort of doing this. I'm going to be talking about under vine cover crops or under tree cover crops. There's a couple of different things that we call these. And so I'll be referring to these terms throughout the presentation. Sometimes we call them understory cover crops. And sometimes we call them under vine or under row or under tree ground cover. So just know that whenever I use any of these terms, I'm talking about plants that we plant or let grow underneath the tree rows. There's a lot of different places in the orchard that we can plant vegetation. So I wanna make a, a distinguishment between the aisles and the rows. Um, so obviously we all know we have aisles in the orchard, it's the between row area, and we can grow either perennials or annuals in those areas. Um, and then we have the in row area where also we can grow either annuals or perennials. And the reason I always like to bring up this slide is because, well, those of us in the Midwest, it's sort of just a given that we're growing a perennial in the aisles. Not all regions that are growing apples do this. So, um, and especially that's true for vineyards, not all areas uh, that grow vines actually grow any sort of cover between the rows. So something that we take advantage of here, and it's very helpful to us, obviously, not to have bare soil in between our rows. Um, I won't be focusing really on annual cover crops in this presentation. I'm going to be focusing on perennial ground covers. However, 
there are regions in the US where they do utilize annual cover crops in orchards and vineyards. Um, just a few examples of what these can look like. If you look at this picture to the left, this is a red clover and cereal rye mixture. Um, and in this picture, I was taking the, the photo from up above because this was from research at Penn State where we were measuring the amount of ground cover uh, that, was, uh, that was produced by these covers and seeing on the converse how much soil is actually being exposed because that's a good indicator of how good a cover crop is going to be at managing weeds. Um, this picture in the middle is also from Penn State, and this is a cereal rye, vetch, and clover mix. This one to the right is an Austrian pea and rye mix. Um, that's at the Waseca Research Station down in Waseca, Minnesota. And then this picture on the bottom might be the most striking, and this is a annual mustard cover crop uh, in the aisles in a vineyard in New York. So in in the Midwest, you know, we're always using perennial ground covers between the rows, but like I said earlier, I'm going to be talking about that understory area in the rows today. Today's goals are not necessarily to try to convince you to plant under row ground covers. Um, that's not my mission. You know, I'm not, I'm not an advocate. Uh, I'm just trying to give you the information that you need to be able to make a decision about whether under row ground covers are going to be right for you. Um, we'll talk about some information about how to grow these, how to establish them and how to maintain them as well. And then feel free to, uh, to ask some information about how to maintain those ground covers in your aisles, because I think a lot of the information that I'm going to be talking about today is also applicable to how to maintain healthy grass in the aisles between your rows. So some examples I'm gonna be using are from um, fruit orchards, vineyards, and other climates too. Uh, the reason is this, this is a, a topic where research is really important. However, there hasn't been a ton of studies around this topic. So um, I have to draw from examples in other cropping systems, but we can learn a lot of lessons from them as well. So the first part I'm gonna talk about is how perennial ground cover such as grass can actually impact your vineyard or your orchard. We're gonna talk about what impact these actually have on your trees or your vines. So what are all the reasons why we should care about what's happening on the vineyard floor? Um, in this picture, I've kind of divided this, the brown part is below ground and the green part is above ground. So above ground, the first thing that these impact are weeds. Sometimes for a lot of people, the, the reason they become interested in under row ground covers is in order to try to suppress weeds without the use of herbicides. Below ground, one of their big benefits is erosion control. So uh, this is just a really common principle that planting more plants on the soil helps keep that soil in. Another reason is uh, soil nutrient availability, but we can think about this in both a positive and sort of a negative way. In one sense, if you think about something like clover that fixes nitrogen, it might be able to put a small amount of nitrogen back into the soil. Um, however, other cover crops like grasses, they also tend to take nutrients from the soil. Um, so we need to be thinking about that in both ways. Another way is tree water uptake. And in this case, I'm talking about how the cover crop competes with the trees for water because anything we plant in the orchard also has water demand. So we need to think about that and take it into consideration. Another above ground impact is yield. And uh, the, the studies that I'm going to talk about later address how perennial cover crops underneath the, the canopy can impact the yield of our trees or our vines. Sometimes uh, cover crops can impact organic matter. I think a lot of the time, though, um, we can make assumptions that planting ground covers in an orchard is going to increase organic matter in the soil. It's not always necessarily the case. And I'm gonna talk about one study um, uh, where that is discussed. They can impact soil, soil micro communities, um, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, sometimes they can impact soil micro communities, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to translate into uh, the health of the trees. So we'll talk about that as well. They can impact insects and diseases. Um, sometimes your, your ground cover management can 
uh, provide a habitat for insect pests or beneficial insects. And if you have a ground cover that creates a nice moist canopy uh, where that dew or that rainfall sticks around, we may have increased disease as well. So it's just something to consider. And then of course, tree vigor and growth rate. This ties into yield. And we'll definitely be talking about um, how to decrease the amount that you know, a cover crop is going to compete with your trees for vigor and growth. I mentioned erosion is one of the first uh, ways that your ground cover can impact your orchard system. This picture is again from a vineyard, um, but in this particular example, this is a, a vineyard that I work with here in Minnesota and they planted this really gorgeous vineyard last year. No, it was, it was 2020 when they planted it. Um, and so when they tilled this hill, it's, a, it's actually a really steep hill, you can't necessarily tell in the photo, but we were dealing with a lot of erosion because it happened to rain quite a bit after they planted. Um, and so we were trying to figure out, you know, solutions to this and what would actually be feasible for their scale. And one of the things we decided, like, maybe let's experiment with um, putting down straw underneath the rows and then seeing if we can, you know, stop the soil from eroding that way. What happened was, of course, a lot of weeds grew in the straw. Um, but it, you know, planting a cover, at least in between the rows, can help uh, decrease the amount of erosion. So that might be one reason you consider ground covers within the row as well, just maybe not on new vines. So these are the same, uh, this is the same vineyard that I showed in the last photo just a year later. So I took these photos in the summer of 2021. Um, this picture on the right, these are the same rows that I just showed on the previous slide. And these are the rows directly to their left. The variety is Itasca, by the way, in case you were curious. But you can see how on these rows to the right where they put down straw and then the weeds started coming through and were difficult to control, they really stunted the growth of those vines compared to the vines where there was no understory cover. And so um, while you can use this as an erosion tactic, I wouldn't really recommend uh, do, using ground covers as an erosion tactic under the vines in the first year. And I'm gonna delve into how the age of the vines impacts your decision uh, later on in the presentation in more depth. So then I want to just set the stage here with what would be the perfect undervine cover crop. Um, some of the things that we're looking for are you want something that's low growing. I would even argue that the grass that's under the orchard rows in this photo is a little bit tall. And this was fairly early in the season. As you can see, there's no red fruit yet. So you can imagine that that grass is going to continue getting taller and taller unless they're occasionally going in and weed whacking it, which is what they had to do in this orchard. And so you ideally want something shorter than that that's not going to keep getting taller and taller. There are plenty of species like that that exist. So I'm going to talk about those later. You ideally want something that's going to be nice and competitive with weeds, but not too competitive with the fruit crop. So there's a challenge there. You want something that's ideally easy to establish. And I would recommend in, in our climate where we're not really cultivating underneath the rows very often to plant a perennial and not mess around with an annual uh, cover crop. Of course you can if you want to experimentally. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about some research studies next. And so before I get into that, I wanna set the stage and give a couple of visuals of what a fruit or orchard cover crop research can look like. Um, this is the research that I did for my master's work. Um, this is actually me here with my brother back in 2013, probably, um, looking into a soil pit. And this soil pit happens to be in a forest research site, but uh, researchers will sometimes uh, dig these soil pits in orchards and vineyards as well. And what that allows us to do is jump into that pit peri periodically throughout the season and watch the root growth and see how something like a cover crop is impacting the crop's root growth. Um, so this photo in the middle is a soil core. You can see Don in the left here. He is using a post pounder to get that soil core from underneath the vines. And then we would look at those soil cores and see how is the cover crop, which would be growing at the surface of the soil, impacting the grapevine roots, as well as soil moisture and soil fertility deeper down in the soil. Um, root work is not fun. <laughs> and maybe that's one of the reasons why there aren't a whole lot of studies on cover cropping in fruit systems. It's very time consuming um, and takes a lot of labor. <laughs> All right, so the first study I'm going to talk about is mine. It was the one that I did for my master's work. 
Uh, I finished that project up in 2015. I did my master's at Penn State, but the research station where I worked was in Virginia. It was actually Virginia Tech's, it was actually Virginia Tech's uh, research station in Winchester, Virginia. Um, the research was on a cab saw vineyard and throughout that vineyard, um, seven years before I became involved, they established plots with a creeping red fescue cover crop underneath the vines. They had other plots with no cover crop where they were just maintained with traditional herbicide strips. And they were testing to see in the long term, what is the impact of having those cover crops underneath the vines. I really stress the long term because this is, it's really important when you're looking at something like this to not just try it for one year, but to look at it over a number of years. And that's why we try it on research vineyards first, so we don't have to impact commercial vineyards if something goes awry. Um, because you need to see how that cover crop is actually interacting with the crop over a number of years, not just the immediate effect. So we were comparing um, vine vigor, yield, juice and wine qualities, root density at each soil depth, you know, for three feet down, soil nutrient availability, and soil moisture between where we had the cover crop and where we did not. I'm not going to go through all the results of the study today, um, but basically I want to just say what kind of the main takeaways were. In this study, the perennial fescue did lead to uh, reduced grapevine root growth in that top soil. And the reason why this is important is if you think of when we're fertilizing with like an NPK fertilizer, a lot of that nutrient is going to go in the top few inches of the soil. And so the top few inches of the soil are typically a lot more fertile and they get less and less fertile as we go down deep in the soil. And so that top soil is really, really important for apple tree roots, grapevine roots, or whatever other fruit you're growing in your orchard. So if we have a cover crop there, what we found out is that the grapevine roots choose not to compete in that top soil they will actually stop growing their roots for the most part in the top few inches of the soil and focus on growing their roots further down. And so this did, uh, in the beginning, lead to reduced vine vigor, um, as well as reduced soil moisture and nitrogen availability because of the presence of that cover crop taking up and competing for a lot of those nutrients. So was there competition with the cover crop and the vines? Yes, there was. However, was there a significant impact on vine health or yield? That was actually minimal. Um, so what we found was that there were slight yield impacts after seven years of cover cropping. However, in a grapevine system, a lot of the time vineyard managers are thinning out their fruit purposefully because a grapevine can only support so much fruit anyway, just like in an apple orchard, uh, even more so in an apple orchard where we're always doing fruit thinning because the trees can only support so many fruit. So a slight yield impact may be a negative thing, but it also may not matter just depending on your management and the health of your trees. We found little difference in juice or wine quality. And um, one thing that was really nice is we found minimal weed growth in the areas that were under that perennial cover crop. So um, it's also notable to just point out that this or this vineyard had in general, high soil fertility. And it was in Virginia, which is an area that gets a decent amount of rain. And so basically, in this case, we sort of concluded that, yes, they're competing, but there's enough nutrients and water to go around so that the vines were still getting what they needed. I'm going to go into this next study now. This was a study uh, done in 1993 on one-year-old peach seedlings. And so what they were doing here was they had one-year-old peach trees in large pots and they planted a tall fescue or what they called a living sod in the pots with the trees. They wanted to see how the living sod would impact the growth of the trees. And they wanted to look at, does the, the sod impact the trees more if they're being water limited? So sometimes they, uh, and some of the, the treatments, they would not um, irrigate the trees and some they would. And so, um, what they found was, not surprisingly, when they had that living sod or that, that fescue grass growing, the above ground dry weight of the trees, which is a measure of basically tree size uh, or health, was significantly lower than when they did not have that cover crop. Um, and so one of the big takeaways of this sort of study is it can be really risky to plant a, a perennial cover crop with 
a newly planted tree because we don't want to be stunting the growth of those newly planted trees in their first year. Here's another study. Uh, this study was looking at two perennial cover crops, perennial peanut and sweetheart plant. Uh, this was in coffee, so <laughs> obviously not in our climate. And uh, they were specifically looking at how these cover crops suppressed weed growth. And they found that when they planted at a higher density and as these cover crops got older and uh, created more dense canopies over time, they obviously got better weed suppression. And so, um, if the if the plant is slower to establish, like if you have something like a clover that actually establishes very slowly, you're probably going to have poor weed suppression at first, but as it gets more and more dense, its ability to suppress weeds is going to get better over time. Um, and so one thing I, I would just say as a take home um, from this study and others that I've seen that are similar is, uh, you know, I see people plant, let's say a clover cover crop and give up after a year because there's a lot of weeds coming through. It's definitely frustrating to see all those weeds, but it will probably compete better with the weeds after a couple of years once it gets more established. It's just whether or not you're able to um, withstand those couple of weedy years in the beginning. All right, and here I'm gonna ask Amaya to maybe chime in at the end of these next three slides because Amaya did was involved in the research that I'm gonna be talking about on the next few slides. Um, so this was an apple orchard ground cover study. It was a 16 year study, um, but this first, uh, this first publication that they put out uh, in 2005 was after the trees had been there for 10 years. Um, so what they were doing in this study was they, they were looking at medium density um, semi-dwarf apple trees and they were comparing three different treatments underneath the trees. So they were looking at a grass mix mulching under the trees and using herbicides under the trees, both post and pre-emergence. And so the impacts of the living grass were in general, more bacterial and fungal colonies when they had grass under the trees versus when those rows were bare, um, but this had little yield impact. They found better nitrogen retention when there was living grass there, less nitrogen runoff, but they also found a decrease in the fine root growth of the apple trees. Fine roots are those roots that actually are taking up the water and nutrients from the soil. So it is notable that the grass cover crop was competing for space and decreasing the amount of apple fine roots, um, fine roots that were present because that could impact the ability of the tree to take up nutrients and water. Another study from this orchard came out in 2011. So this was after 16 years of this study. And again, this, it's really important with these kinds of studies to look at it in the long term, because uh, in general, what they found in this study was that the, uh, the grass underneath the trees caused those trees to establish a lot more slowly in the first five years. But after about five years, those trees started to adapt to the presence of the cover crop and were able to, in the long term, have yields that were comparable to the trees that were growing on herbicide strips. So again, if you're planting a cover crop on brand new trees, I would expect like a yield drag, but I would also expect it to probably catch up over time. Here's another study again, um, you see a Tucha in that citation. So Amaya was involved in this research. Um, I think it was her PhD research she can, or her postdoc, uh, she can clarify that for you. Um, but this was in 2011 and they were looking at how those different under tree treatments impacted organic matter percentage. Uh, they found the highest organic matter percentage of 7.4 where they had the wood chips under the rows. When the grass was present, they only got 3% organic matter and with those herbicide treatments between 4.2 and 5.6%. Um, so they found that the grass, the presence of the grass did not increase organic matter or nitrogen after 16 years in this study. I mentioned a couple slides ago that they found in the previous study that uh, there was better nitrogen retention and less nitrogen runoff when the grass was present. However, one thing that grasses do is that they are really efficient at taking up and reusing, in other words, recycling nitrogen. So just because there's better nitrogen retention, which is a very good thing, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's more nitrogen available for the vine or the tree roots. 
that nitrogen might just get inserted into the soil, taken up by the grass, and then recycled back by the grass to its own roots rather than going to the tree. I'm going to pause here and just ask Amaya if there's anything you wanted to add about that research. Yeah, one of the things that was very interesting after doing analyzing all that data of those 16 years, and that was my PhD, I did not, it did not take me 16 years to do the PhD, I just was lucky enough to just be there by the end of that study and be able to analyze all that data. But one thing is that, as, as Annie was mentioning, yes, at the beginning, when you uh, in, when you plant those uh, cover crops, in this case, it was grass underneath the trees, we did see a significant reduction in the growth of the tree, that afterwards they were able to catch up with the other treatments that had the herbicide and the treatment with the mulch. But one thing that, that I want to highlight is that so, towards the year number 10 on, it was actually the treatment with the mulch and the grasses that had better tree growth and better yields. So over the long term, it's not only that they balance out, it's that the grass ground cover and the chip, uh, the, the wood mulch, um, mulch, they outperform the bare soil and the treatment that had sporadic applications of herbicide because of soil health overall was so much better and that is something that we do see in the high density systems nowadays that we see that those trees are weak and we see a lot of uh, coal damage just because there's stress and that is definitely related to the excessive use of herbicides that are just breaking down some of the um, you know structure of the soil mm -hmm. Thanks, Amaya. Did you want to comment on the mulch and, you know, the, the relationship between the wood chip mulch and organic matter and nitrogen? Yes. So I, when we were about the end of the study, one thing that we realized, and that's another another part of the study that, that Annie did not present, we did a budget looking at nitrogen and phosphorus over the entire system. So basically, what are the inputs? Where is that nitrogen and that phosphorus coming from, whether it's the organic matter mineralization or it was a fertilizer, but how all of these different pools of nutrients play out. And one thing that we realized is that when we did the analysis of the water that was infiltrated into the soil profile just through precipitation, as we have here, those downpours during the spring, a lot of the breaking down of the mulch was releasing so much nitrogen. So one of the things that we changed in that study is that as we, we used to renew the uh, wood chip mulch every three years, and so we decided to space it to five, just because we were building up so many nutrients in the soil with the breaking down of those uh, wood chip mulches. And that's something to consider if you're gonna use that as a strategy on the long term uh, for your orchards or your vineyard is that you're going to get a lot of nitrogen coming out of that as it breaks down over the years. Thank you, Amaya. All right. Yeah, and that's why um, I was glad she was on this call and moderating it today because, you know, I can talk about somebody else's research and obviously as extension educators, that's what we do all the time, but the person who actually did the research will have a lot more to say about it. So thank you. Um, if I'm just going to sort of sum up some of the, the major take homes from those studies, there's a number of things going on below ground. So I would say in general with bare soil, with apple trees and grapevines and things like blueberries, for instance, we know that a lot of their roots are growing in the top several inches of the soil, like the top foot of the soil, because that's where they're going to find the most fertility. Um, but when we plant ground covers, what I found in my research, and there's been further research on this at Penn State since, we know that those roots tend to go deeper and uh, grow less in those top uh, several inches of soil. And so if the, if the soil is limiting in things like water, space, and nutrients, that can cause too, comp too much competition. But if there's enough to go around, it might be okay. So above ground, those undervine covers under new trees like Amaya talked about, can delay growth and yield, but in later years, those trees might adapt. And in the case of Amaya study, those trees actually did better and outperformed the trees where there was herbicide applied for 16 years. 
Um, there's probably going to be less competition between the tree and the cover crop in richer soil because there's more to go around. And another thing that I would say from these studies uh, is the impact of cover crops on weeds is mixed. So if you've got a cover crop that's denser and there's less light shining on the soil through the cover crop, you're probably gonna have better weed control. Some of the management takeaways, establish cover crops under mature trees, not necessarily brand new trees. I would recommend giving those trees a chance to grow first. If needed, you can use irrigation to reduce water competition. Um, you may also consider fertilizing and doing foliar sampling regularly to reduce nutrient competition. We always recommend foliar sampling, but I think it's especially important if you have an understory cover crop that's also needing nutrients. And then a less dense cover crop is probably going to reduce competition, but it's also probably going to increase weed growth. So that's something to consider. Um, so if weeds are something that's a big problem for you and you're trying to get away from herbicides, but you have plenty of water and nutrients available, then undervine cover crops may be a good choice for you. So let's talk about establishing them. Like I talked about earlier, the ideal type of understory perennial cover crop would be something that's dense, short, and ideally you don't have to spend too much time maintaining it. So if you can find like a no-mo uh, cover crop, that's gonna be great. Some examples of low growing species under a foot tall include the fescues. There's a lot of fescue species and varieties out there. Bluegrass, perennial white clovers, um, possibly some really short spreading plants, like you could try something like creeping thyme, wild strawberry, et cetera, if you have a really small orchard or garden. Um, or you could also just grow the natural vegetation depending on what kind of vegetation you have. And I know uh, at least a couple of vineyards in Minnesota that are doing that, and then they will just wheat whack um, around the vines. It depends on whether or not, you know, it depends on the size of your vineyard and whether or not that's feasible. Other considerations, something with a really dense canopy naturally would be nice. So there are grasses that have more of a bunching habit that are going to be more dense, and those no-mo turf grasses like fine fescues. You want it to be low growing, easy and cheap to source, Establish quickly would be really nice because the quicker it establishes, the less chance there is for weeds to come up through it. And you may want to add in clovers. Um, if you want to do clovers, a recommendation that the, the turf grass program and myself agree on is to mix it in with the grasses. The grasses are the things that have really strong weed control. Um, we know from research and from grower experiences that clover does not necessarily have as good of weed control as grass because uh, clovers just don't grow quite as densely. And so there's more sunlight getting through to that soil and allowing weeds to grow through. Um, you can incorporate clovers if you're interested in nitrogen fixation, but I, I, unless you're really determined to do it, I wouldn't recommend doing 100% clover. Um, flowering plants, that's a question mark, and we're going to discuss that in the coming slide, but I want people to think about, until we get, that, get to that slide, why might it not be a good idea to plant flowering plants in your orchard? Um, perennial grasses, so I'm going to just dig a little deeper into those. I consert, cons consulted with the uh, turf extension program at University of Minnesota for some recommendations because they have a really strong fescue evaluation and breeding program at the U. So some that they recommended based on being no mow, so lower maintenance and drought tolerance include these that I have listed. So it's creeping red fescue, chewing's fescue, hard fescue, and sheep's fescue. And um, according to the turf program, all of those are going to be hardy, at least in zone four. Um, I don't know about zone three, I would have to check. Um, so tall fescue is another option. Of course, it's going to grow taller than those fine fescues, so you may have to mow it more often, but it is drought tolerant. Tufted turf grass, or sorry, tufted hair grass might be nice because it has better shade tolerance. It takes low fertility. However, it is more drought sensitive. Um, the turf program gave me a list of grass species maybe to avoid for this scenario. Um, annual ryegrass and annual bluegrass, which are of course annuals, but you often find them in turf mixes. So if you're getting a turf mix from like a turf grass seed supplier, I would just check on that. Um, rough bluegrass is intolerant to heat. Lynn perennial rye and Kentucky 31 tall fescue. I don't know the reasons, but those were recommended against by the turf program. Um, Kentucky bluegrass is higher maintenance and it takes a lot of fertilizer. Perennial ryegrass is not reliably winter hardy. 
and bent grasses take too much water. So um, those are just some recommendations from the turf program. If you want more information, you can go on their website. They have quite a lot of resources online. When you're planting perennial grasses, the best two times in Minnesota to plant are in spring, April, right now is a great time to lay down some seed or fall like September in Minnesota. Um, putting them down in fall gives them time, gives those seeds time to be rained on a few times as well as time to uh, grow a few inches tall before the winter. It's best to lightly cultivate those in, in order to get that good soil to seed contact and to keep some moisture on those seeds from the soil. If you absolutely can't cultivate them in, you can just sprinkle them on the top of the soil. But if you do that, you're relying a lot more on a rainfall shortly after seeding. Um, if you want to include forbs like a clover, you can do that to add diversity. The turf program, um, Maggie Ryder, who's the turf extension educator, recommended a 10% clover, 90% fescue mix. She says that that sounds like not much clover. However, those clover seeds are super small. And so you're actually gonna end up getting a pretty good stand of clover if you, even if you only have 10% in that grass mix. Um, she recommended with a seeding rate of maybe about half of the recommended rate for lawn. So if you go to like a turf grass lawn seed supplier, um, the rate that they're going to recommend would be really expensive to seed a whole orchard with. Um, and so we were, Maggie and I were consulting that maybe about half of that rate would be appropriate. After sowing the seed, just like crops and weeds, cover crops require water, nutrients, and sunlight. So um, if you have enough of those to go around, maybe you don't need to worry about it. But if you are limited, you know, you might have to consider watering, especially during establishment or in an extreme year. And it's best to use drought tolerant species if possible. As far as nutrient management, um, everyone's nutrient management regimen is so different. Um, I'm sure everyone in this call uses different nutrient management techniques. Uh, if you are already applying nitrogen every year out of necessity, you might want to slightly increase that if you plant a grass cover crop because that grass is taking up some of that nitrogen. But if you already have high or excessive nitrogen in your foliar test report, reports, especially after you already plant the grass, then you should probably um, be able to skip that annual nitrogen. Uh, these grasses do not require P or K fertilizer. In fact, we really recommend against applying potassium to, uh, to lawns in Minnesota, and the same would go for a cover crop. I, I know that some people have to apply P and K fertilizer for your fruit crop, but all I'm saying here is don't add extra P or K just for the sake of the cover crop. Fine fescues do not need to be mowed, but the turf grass program recommends mowing them one to two times per year um, it, because this really helps stimulate new growth. Uh, otherwise you get that, that mat of dormant grass um, kind of just building up every year. So they'd recommend just doing a little bit of mowing here and there, but nothing too time consuming. It should be very low maintenance. Um, don't do any cultivation except during planting or maybe if you need to reseed areas. Think about your herbicides because after you plant a cover crop, you need to rethink about if I'm if you're still going to be applying herbicides at all. You know, ideally you would be able to go without herbicides completely, but if you are going to need to spray, um, try to avoid herbicides with perennial grass activity, unless you're actually trying to knock back the grass canopy. And I'm not going to go through what those herbicide options are today. Um, if you look in the Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide it lists this really awesome table of herbicides that are labeled for each of the fruit crops that we grow in Minnesota. Um, I mentioned the Midwest Guide a lot <laughs> during these webinars. So hopefully everybody has a copy now, either on PDF or hard copy, Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide, and just look up options in there. We've talked a lot about when to establish cover crops and how the effect of a cover crop is different on a new vine than it is on a, or sorry, new vine or tree than it is on a mature tree or vine. And the long-term studies that I talked about found that in-row vegetation can cause slow growth or stunted growth um, right in the beginning and maybe a yield drag, but it seems that the, a lot of time the plants are able to kind of um, compensate for that and, and adapt over time. Um, so it does take some patience and, and that's up to you as the orchard manager, whether or not you're, you're okay taking that risk. 
Um, so I would recommend waiting until about year five. You know, that might be a little conservative, but planting covers after uh, the trees have been in the ground in year five should be safer. Just let them get up to the top wire um, or, you know, 16 feet before you start planting something. And you could use herbicides, mulch, flaming, or maybe even a light cultivation before that just to keep managing weeds. And then if you really want to plant a cover in year one, you're probably going to need to increase fertilizer and water in order to support it and the tree. So the question I mentioned earlier, should flowering plants be included in the vineyard or in the orchard? And, um, you know, when I first thought about this question during a webinar a couple of years ago, I was like, well, yeah, of course, <laughs> you know, to support pollinators. But then um, it, it was really, you know, brought to my attention by pollinator experts in this, in this webinar in 2021. Uh, who advised against using flowering species in the orchard or the vineyard. And the reason is that a lot of the insecticides that we apply, regardless of whether they're conventional or organic, are highly toxic to bees. So even if you're growing organically, but you're using something like Entrust or Pyganic, that can still kill bees. And so bees, if, we're, if we have a lot of flowering plants in the orchard, bees are going to be attracted by that. And then if we go and spray an insecticide, um, it can serve as an accidental attract and kill. So a safer practice, according to these uh, pollination specialists, is to plant pollinator plants on the outskirts of an orchard, but not necessarily right in there where you're going to be spraying regularly. If you want more information on pollinator-friendly plant species and how to care for pollinators in your orchard, this is something that's really important to me, even though it's not the focus of this talk today, I just wanted to mention some of these resources. University of Minnesota has a Flowers for Pollinators project where there's a list of easily available um, pollinator flowers. The U of M B Lab has awesome information about all things pollinators, as does the Xerxes Society. And the Minnesota Board of Soil and Water Resources has a pollinator initiative webpage as well. All right, so that's um, basically it for my talk, except I'll go to this slide first. Just to summarize, so some of the benefits of cover cropping and why you might consider it are, one, maybe you have excessively growing grapevines or apple trees that are out of control, <laughs> maybe, and you wanna limit their vigor. That would be one benefit. Um, another reason would be to suppress weeds and get rid of the use of herbicides in your orchard. Another would be to attract beneficials, but of course, like I just mentioned, that has issues. Um, stopping erosion and retaining nitrogen. The challenges include when to plant, watering to establish the seed, uh, choosing dense grass species to compete with weeds, and then you might need to make some slight management changes to support both the vines and the ground cover. I would wait instead of uh, you know planting with new vines. I would wait a little bit, and you know you can overseed flowering species as desired, but think about pollinator safety when you do that. So just wanted to go back. Eh, my computer is not letting me go back a slide, um, but we're on to the questions now. And so I just, um, one thing I wanted to ask people is if you've ever tried perennial ground covers in your orchard and, and how did that go for your, or what are your thoughts? And then we can take questions as well. So thank you. Thank you, Annie. Um, if people have any, any questions, you can just go ahead and, and post them. In, in the chat and I can read them out loud. Uh, I did post the two links where the recording of this webinar will be. So if you wanna go back and, and just um, review some of the information that Annie shared today, you can find it there. I also going to um, start a poll some for recording some uh, data on, on the webinar. And so while we wait for people to post some questions on the chat, I'm just going to go ahead and, and launch that poll. So Annie, what, one of the things that, that I, I remember hearing a lot about uh, using um, legumes, especially clover, is some issues with um, voles. What, mm -hmm. What's your take on that? Um, I don't know enough about mammalogy to know if, uh, <laughs> if voles are especially attracted to clover. I have heard people say that as well. Yeah, that, that, that is definitely a problem. And, and I guess with any cover crop that you establish on, on the tree road, it's just that you, you give them that refugee to, you know, 
hide from the predators. So mowing those cover crops is sort of like a, a necessity if you want to make sure that you're deterring them from nesting around there, but also the need for making sure that you have tree guards and vine guards that are protecting when when you just when you have like young trees and vines because they they can be devastating and, and really damage those trees during the winter. Mm -hmm. um, something else that I didn't mention uh, in the presentation, but sometimes I do is that there was research at, in Minnesota a couple of years ago on Japanese beetles that found that Japanese beetles have trouble laying their eggs if you're growing a really tall grass canopy. Um, so that can be one, you know, small other benefit potentially of, uh, of planting tall covers in your orchard. Of course, as we know, Japanese beetles will still fly in from other places, even if we somehow manage to get them out of our orchard. So they're just a difficult pest. Yeah, there, there's so many things to consider when it comes to the cover crop. It's just not, you know, only thinking about the, the development of the trees and the yield, but truly it's, it's just, it changes entire Kind of like ecosystem down there and affects from say like from pests to you know mammals or yeah mm -hmm. yeah if i can make a comment on japanese beetle um yes. just raising the cutting height of your whatever grass you're using is also going to probably have the same effect on overposition. so just raising the height to i forgot like three inches or something like that is going to be you know providing some of that deterrent effect from the egg laying position uh, situation. I don't see any questions on the chat box. Just that people are very quiet. Our they are quiet. today. <laughs> Annie, I have better, a question. Yes. Sorry. Ahead. Um, so just talking about insects and, and maybe pathogens as well. Um, I don't know if you've seen any data on cover crops, whether it's for apple or for um, vineyards, on the impact on pathogens and on insects that there may be. I know some on the insects, but just wondering if you have any information on that. Not specifically. Um, it's just if you have a lot of grass cover, it's creating that you know, really moist canopy that can potentially um, harbor disease pathogens in some cases. But no, I do not have uh, specific examples about that. Okay. We did actually, for some of you, maybe you joined that, there was a Wisconsin Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Conference. I think it was the first one in the pandemic where we did under vine management um, in the grape truck. And so we did talk about that and I forgot, of course, on the disease standpoint, but Leslie Holland put a talk together on that. And, and I talked about insects and kind of the bottom line for me on what I found on insects management in grapevine, grape uh, vineyards, sorry, um, is that it varies on what insects you're looking at. So whether it's sometimes it will improve the, the number of beneficial insects that you have that may provide pest management for pest insects, but in some other cases, you also increase pest problems. So it seems to be a little bit variable. And so I think it would be very dependent on what system you're looking at and what cover crop you're looking at and how that's gonna affect the pest complex mm -hmm. and beneficial complex. So I don't, I wouldn't have a, a quick answer because it's not, it's very specific to your system, your pest, your beneficial insects and, and what cover crop you're gonna use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, that we're gonna wrap it up. I don't see any any other questions. I did again put the links there for where the the recordings are going to be posted. If you want to review some of the information shared today, I really thank Annie for putting together this talk and for sharing all this awesome information. Um, and yeah, thank you. This is the end of our series for this spring, and we'll hopefully come back next uh, year with more webinars. Oh. All right. Thank you, Amaya. Thank Have you, a good day, everyone. And bye, -bye. Thank, thank you. Organizing everything. That was great. <laughs> see you all next year. <laughs>